Thank you for allowing me here today, everyone. Um, my name is Jason Kirsted. I'm the Chief Technical Officer of Threat Management for IBM Security, where I lead our technology direction for cybersecurity products and capabilities in the threat management lifecycle. This includes threat intelligence creation, detection, analysis, and response. I'm also privileged to be the co-chair of the Open Cybersecurity Alliance Project Governing Board. At the OCA, our mission is to enable increased out-of-the-box interoperability and the creation of an improved cross-vendor cybersecurity ecosystem. What I'm here to talk to you today about is open security. First of all, what is open security? How do you define it? Why do we care about it? And assuming we do, how can we encourage more industry movement towards it? To kick this off, I wanna level set us all on the overall information technology landscape. We know that forward leading companies, the ones that are gonna lead us in this next era are embracing change. They're refactoring apps to become more modular, containerized, and they've shifted their applications to SaaS services like email, workforce management, collaboration suites, et cetera, in order to move fast and scale. They're treating their data as a shared resource between their departments. match the right workload to the right cloud environment for their business in an open and safe way. But the success of all this change, it's really dependent on one universal requirement, cybersecurity. Why? Because the company's digital future requires security to deliver privacy, resiliency, compliance, and so on. Your customers demand it and your reputation depends on it. Security needs to address all of these key transformations. But that can be a challenge. This is the current disconnected world that we live in today. Public cloud, private cloud, traditional infrastructure, security sprinkled everywhere. It's very difficult to detect threats, difficult to investigate and remediate, simply because we're not talking to each other. These four themes echo and align with the point of view that we receive from our clients. There's too much work to do to manage the state of cybersecurity in an enterprise. And even assuming you had budget to hire them, there's simply not enough skilled practitioners available. The problem is exacerbated by the fact that there's too many vendors and too much complexity. How can we ever expect the skills gap in this industry to close when the best agreed tool chain that's required for folks to do their job changes every 12 months. Finally, there's too many alerts and incidents to deal with. Meanwhile, simultaneously, those incidents that do exist often lack context and intelligence due to the lack of seamless information flows across this overly complex ecosystem of vendors and tools. This current state of cybersecurity, it's simply unsustainable long-term. But how can we as an industry address it? I believe that one place that we as an industry can look to for inspiration is if we look to our predecessors in information technology, mature areas such as operating systems, applications, data, and technology management. Over the past two decades, all of these areas have come together to mature themselves with an open approach that's fueled innovation in every major technology category. The evidence is indisputable that open technology is winning the day. Security is the next frontier when it comes to open. Of course, there's a handful of popular open source security tools that you've heard of and likely have used in your careers. And open standards are currently the foundation for many areas of cybersecurity around things like cryptography, identity management, et cetera. However, the adoption of open as the de facto standard for how to do mainstream development models in cybersecurity it's still in its infancy compared to other areas of the IT sector. Let's think about how we can come together in a more open and meaningful way. In order to come together, first let's try to figure out what's been keeping us apart. Let's start with a basic premise. What security is at its core is mitigation against fear and uncertainty. I'm sure many folks here are aware of the CIA model, confidentiality, integrity, and availability. These three key attributes are supposed to define the state of a cybersecurity practice. However, we have to highlight that this CIA model is supposed to apply to data, 
not to the cybersecurity practice itself. There exists a fundamental tension in the cybersecurity space between core principles such as the privacy of the individual versus the situational awareness of attacks and collaboration around defensive posture versus sharing of your knowledge with your adversaries. This tension is a good thing and it's important. Unfortunately, the history of cybersecurity has led to the industry over pivoting towards one extreme of this model. And in this slide in the upper right. Enter open security. In order to define open security, first let's talk about open technology in general. I have this great quote from Aaron Hammer at Walmart. Open technology is developed in the open with full transparency, leveraging community-driven processes which allow everyone to participate freely. Everyone is free to implement the results and community decisions are made based on technical merit. How can we take these concepts and effectively apply them to cybersecurity? And why would we want to do that? Traditional security is characterized by closed and proprietary point products. There's a lack of standards and interoperability across tools and data sets. And this approach leads to our currently fragmented product landscape. It also results in large inefficiencies in a domain that really needs every advantage, big and small, to stay ahead of attackers and the skills gaps that we all face. Open security, however, accelerates innovation built on a foundation of open standards for interoperability and integrations, fostering a community of experts and a user-driven innovation model. This leads to a faster innovation velocity. And by working together, we have the potential to deliver disruptive and game-changing technology solutions for our industry. The benefits that come from open security align to two key pillars, trust and transparency, the fact that you can see the code, the solution, the practice, and that it's doing what you expect it to do. And there's not hidden pitfalls to relying on this in your environment. This is enabled by increased collaboration and the power of the crowd being brought to cybersecurity. Speed and awareness, having near real-time access to the latest innovations and research as it is developed, allowing you to speed time to value, which in this space, means protection against the latest threats against your environment. These two pillars can furthermore be mapped into the two different phases of the overall cybersecurity lifecycle, the creation and building of secure solutions and the operations and threat detection required to secure an enterprise. On the left, we have some of the basic building blocks when it comes to secure solutions, including cryptography, privacy, platform security, cloud security, trusted and unbiased AI. As we seek to consume to collaborate on these building blocks in the open, we can enhance our trust around them by ensuring that a proper DevSecOps lifecycle is wrapped around the consumption of these technologies to gain back more of that trust in the open space. As we shift to the right and we attempt to secure our actual environment, open security can be a vital tool in our arsenal as we seek to combat novel threats by engaging in this increased collaboration and ex information exchange across the community. The knowledge gained from these communities can then furthermore be mapped back into our solution creation during that DevSecOps lifecycle, completing the feedback loop. We all now agree that open security is critically important. It speeds innovation, enables better detections and improves your defense. What is it comprised of though? We at IBM have aligned the concept of open security around four key pillars. The first pillar is open standards. Standards in cybersecurity do exist. However, there's still a lot of work to be done. A remarkable statistic to emphasize this point is that we see organizations are spending as much money trying to get their cybersecurity tools to work with each other as they are in their actual cybersecurity practices. This area obviously needs a lot of improvement. The second pillar is open source. Open source code allows for rapid research and innovation, as well as allows organizations to sometimes fill gaps in their tool set that the market has not yet filled. We are seeing a noticeable shift, both in client interest as well as investment in open source cybersecurity products over the past 24 months. 
The third pillar is collaboration around intelligence and analytics. While there's a marked improvement in the sharing of some types of information, most notably threat intelligence, we still see that 66% of organizations are not even doing that. And that almost 50% of organizations outsource almost all of their threat intelligence. When it comes to detection and analytics, these numbers unfortunately are likely both in the single digits. The fourth pillar is best practices, which enable best of breed solutions to be brought to bear in your environment, no matter what its size. Organizations that are able to leverage existing best practices tend to see a dramatic reduction in effort spent on their cybersecurity program. Let's dive a little bit more deeply into each one of these pillars and explore them in more detail. The first is standards. Standards are what make the world go round and they're what allow you to operate in everyday modern life. Standards are what allow you to perform a task as simple as plugging your newly purchased toaster oven into the wall and be assured that not only will that plug fit into the outlet, but that it won't explode or catch fire the first time that you try to use it. In information technology, standards are what allow our systems to communicate and interoperate. This is not really new and cybersecurity standards have existed for a long time. However, we are finding that as an industry, we still have a ways to go to ensure that the standards that we create are both effortlessly consumable and workable for the end organization if they're going to achieve the purpose that they were meant for. While a representative sampling of some cybersecurity standards are shown here, this diagram is not by any means meant to be all encompassing. There are many more cybersecurity standards that exist than are shown in this slide. The second area is open source code. A piece of software either developed for a specific cybersecurity function or to provide a specific cybersecurity capability. It would be false to presume that cost is the only driver in adopting open source cybersecurity products. While cost is sometimes a factor in adoption, open source solutions for controlling security, security and privacy are slowly becoming the new de facto standard occasionally to address existing commercial software gaps, but just as often because they provide more open integrations. Organizations such as the Open Cybersecurity Alliance are trying to use open source as a basis for improving the outcomes of standardization by providing a common place that vendors and consumers can collaborate on open source tool chains that among other things, make cybersecurity standards work. Governance is another area that is important here as well. Having open governance around any significant cybersecurity open source project is essential in order to ensure the long-term viability of that project. Open intelligence analytics collaboration. Vendors, as well as the community, have started to build tools to better create share, collaborate on, and use cyber threat intelligence, as well as detections and analytics. These tools and data sets provide open cross-platform ways to express data, as opposed to doing them in proprietary formats that are too costly for enterprises to adopt and maintain. These trends are only going to accelerate, as any single vendor or defender will never be able to cover the entire threat landscape. As previously mentioned, while we see a moderate uptake of collaboration around threat intelligence, collaboration around analytics is still very much in the nascent stages of this industry, which is a shame because we often see the same detections being developed over and over and over again across our client base. Finally, we have best practices. Best practice frameworks consist of guidelines and best practices to manage cybersecurity related risk. These cost effective approaches help to promote protection and resilience of things like critical infrastructure and allow smaller organizations with more finite resources to consume and deploy the best practices that are curated by best of breed subject matter experts and practitioners. One of the most well known promoters of best practice frameworks is NIST with the NIST cybersecurity framework, which consists of standards, guidelines, 
and best practices to manage risk. Another very important best practice framework would be the CIS common controls. And finally, we have new standards like cacao, which are being created in order to allow you to collaborate on and consume best practices in an easily consumable operations playbook format. As we wrap up this section, let's step back for a moment to think, what is the common thread of all of these different pillars of open security? Community. Communities combined with the previously discussed efforts are what create the competitive advantage for open security. Otherwise known as the power of the crowd, community is the underlying fabric of it all. As an industry, we have to learn how to lean into and embrace these community-driven models of standards, code, intelligence, analytics, and best practice. Only then will we be able to keep pace with and hopefully get ahead of emerging threats. Is our point of view in this unique? Thankfully, it's not. As we shared this vision with our partners and others in this industry, we found that there were many who agreed with us. One way that we are promoting and supporting open security is through the Open Cybersecurity Alliance or the OCA. The OCA is a group of like-minded cybersecurity organizations who have come together to agree on commonly developed open source code, tooling, technology, and standards to promote openness and interoperability between cybersecurity products. The OCA was launched in October last year with initial technology contributions from IBM Security, McAfee, and Oasis. A month ago, the OCA was pleased to collaborate with NIST in accepting its third major new project, the SCAP V2 data collection prototype. Security Automation Protocol, or SCAP, consists of a number of different open standards that are widely used to enumerate software flaws and configuration issues related to security. Applications that conduct security monitoring use these standards when measuring systems to find vulnerabilities, and they offer these methods to score those findings in order to evaluate the possible impact. The SCAP V2 suite of standardizations standardizes this nomenclature and the formats that these automated vulnerability management, measurement, and policy compliant products produce and consume. All of these open technologies that we've been discussing are foundational to our new platform, IBM Cloud Pack for Security. Cloud Pack for Security is a platform that can deliver on connecting data, connecting workflows, and connecting openly by helping you quickly integrate your existing cybersecurity tools to gain deeper insights into threats, orchestrate actions, and automate responses, all while leaving your data where it is IBM Security leverages the hybrid multi-cloud foundation of Red Hat OpenShift in order to deliver a next generation security platform that brings together multiple disparate, previously disconnected cybersecurity data silos via a common universal insights fabric. This first of a kind platform frees you from having to care about where your data is, what cloud it's in, what format it's in, and allows unified security workflows to act on the same data and allow them to be leveraged across all the applications that are developed and delivered on this platform. Some of the applications that are available include threat intelligence insights to allow threat intelligence from all sources to be made immediately actionable in a context specific way relative to your individual environment. The X-Force Threat Score makes it easy to see how relevant each threat is to you, and AMI Affected lets you run manual or automatic scans of your connected data sources. Data Explorer, where instead of digging through all of your separate tools and data sources to investigate, threat hunters and incident responders can quickly run a query for one place and have visibility across all of your data sources and separate tools to record and add the results to an investigation. And then from the same screen, you can see connected insights about that incident or IP or indicator and what's going on with it in your environment. 
you can then track your investigations into a case and leverage those cases using incident response with SOAR. Incident response with SOAR allows response automation and orchestration across hundreds of different integrations, including leveraging the power of Red Hat Ansible. This allows you to apply automation to your incident response processes to reduce the time it takes to respond. Instead of burdening your team with manual and repetitive tasks, you can streamline and automate them and prioritize your analyst workload to focus on their high value activities. Orchestrate act actions across your whole organization with third-party apps and integrations to better connect your team and connect your other business areas and utilize custom playbooks to execute the right plan for your team with each investigation. While we've talked about the nature, the open nature of Cloud Pack for security, to underscore it again, we've built this as an open platform because we believe that the future of security is open. The Cloud Pack for security sits on a foundation of an open ecosystem and data connectors that can be developed for any security tool. We've committed to open source initiatives to enable these data connectors because we think that they can improve on how security tools are being developed and consumed across the industry. And we furthered that commitment by being a founding member of this Open Cybersecurity Alliance to connect the fragmented cybersecurity landscape with common open source code and practices. Furthermore, with IBM Security's robust experience and services, we can offer a range of options for providing guidance to running your cybersecurity program. We offer services to develop custom connectors, as well as expertise with things like on-demand data access as needed using the cloud back for security. And generally, from strategic advisory consulting, incident response, design, and deploy services, to cloud and managed security services, our services enable you, you to activate global intelligence innovate without introducing risk and mature your cybersecurity program over time. With that, I want to thank you with allowing me to speak with you and I hope you enjoy the rest of the event. As always, I'm more than happy to field any questions as time permits. Thank you very much and have a good day. And um, a couple of questions are actually coming in right now. So I'll quickly answer those. Um, uh, the first question is, what are some of the challenges with creating open sharing communities with different countries? Do you see challenges or hesitations with collaborating with certain jurisdictions? Um, yes, that is a very good question. There, there are often, um, uh, you know, I'll, I'll say not only data residency concerns, but occasionally, especially recently, there's been increasing geopolitical tensions in some aspects with, with collaborating in the open. Um, what I would say that, that we encourage is that when, when you participate in the open, um, in trusted sharing communities, it actually reduces some of that risk because what, what we are seeing and, and have seen traditionally in this space is that um, there's a tendency and I spoke about this earlier in the presentation, there's, there's been a tendency for a long time to try to hold most of our cards close to the chest as it were. And um, I, I, I firmly believe that, you know, while that will continue to be important um, for some aspects of uh, cyber threat detection, including when you're, you know, engaged in, um, let's say, um, uh, counterintelligence type of activities, for the vast majority of enterprises and the vast majority of situations, you have very little to gain by trying to, you know, keep, keep, hold your cards close to your chest. And the reason I say that is because what we see across our client base, again, is that we tend to see, um, especially when you look across at industries, the same types of threats um, being perpetrated across our clients. And, and more, most importantly, from my perspective, we see clients often developing over and over again the exact same detections and analytics. Because they're not collaborating with their peers, 
um, they're actually expanding a, a, an incredible, you know, when you measure it across the industry, it's an incredible amount of duplicative effort that's being spent developing detections, developing instant response playbooks, and, and mapping those things to threat intelligence. And, and I believe that there's, um, there's a, an ample opportunity in our space to come together and more effectively collaborate. Um, because the adversaries are collaborating. The adversaries are not only collaborating, but they're offering their services um, you know, to, the top, to the highest bidder in a, an extremely well-organized, well-oiled machine. And if we wanna be able to co combat that effectively, we really need to figure out how to collaborate better, not just in the threat intelligence space, which you know, we finally started to come a bit of ways there, but more in the detection space as well and collaborating around detections in the open as opposed to reinventing it often. Um, second question, could you talk a little bit on the challenges of federated search? We face particular challenges with inconsistent data. Yes, um, uh, I, I could talk about the challenges with federated search. Um, that, you know, that, that could be a whole uh, conference event by itself. Um, I, I've written about this extensively in the past uh, around the challenges of cybersecurity data modeling. And um, when, you, when you look at the, the space of federated search, it's really a data modeling problem. And what, what we have developed with Cloud Pack for Security and open sourced under the Open Cybersecurity Alliance is this technology that we built called Stick Shifter. And what we're trying to do with that is create a consistent uniform data model for all of the different cybersecurity products in the industry in order to have them map to it. And for that, we use the STIX2 cybersecurity model as a base and the STIX2 cybersecurity object model. And we, we, we develop extensions to that model as required only. And essentially the technology by creating this bi-directional translation back and forth between that uniform model, it allows you to um, abstract away the problem, the mapping problems as it were, um, between all of the different cybersecurity products. It, the, the reason that, that this is so powerful and effective is because anybody who's ever developed anything leveraging machine learning um, or tried to perform threat hunting activities or build a cybersecurity product um, knows the challenge that data modeling can be. And they're, re they're really, the, you know, there's this famous quote, there is no AI without IA. Uh, and IA and that, that quote stands for information architecture. And essentially cloud pack for security is designed around a uniform information architecture. So as long as we can get the data into that uniform information architecture format from the source data, we can work with it. We can build applications on top of it. We can build analytics on top of it, et cetera. So that's really the, the power with that platform and how we tackle the challenges with inconsistent data. Um, the, another question that came in is how do you suggest we manage the human bottlenecks in threat management? Uh, great question. Um, threat management, you know, it, it really is a people process and technology problem. Um, there's never going to be a situation where we can solve each and every problem using technology. There's always going to be people required and, um, a strong emphasis as well on the area that's often forgotten in that triangle, the process. Um, what I find is, you know, if, if you invest in your technology strategically and you create a very robust process, then the burden on your people power is actually reduced. And um, I, I think that the, there's a couple of different ways that, that you can become effective there. First is uh, by utilizing increased automation where appropriate. Um, there's a, actually a very strong push towards automation in this space in a way that we haven't seen in a long time. Um, you know, there, there, there's, and, and I believe that it is uh, tightly related to the skills gap and the skills shortage. People are trying to make up with it by increasing automation, but it's not just because of that, it's also because of the recognition that um, we have to be fast. We have to be quick to respond much quicker than in the past and reduce the amount of dwell time for our adversaries. 
And the only way we can do that is by, you know, leveraging automation, leveraging AI, using that to augment that people process and technology triangle. Again, you know, anybody trying to say that if you bring this such and such AI or such and such um, automation to your environment, you're going to completely reduce your need for, you know, competent personnel that's, that's snake oil. But it is a triangle and you can over, you can over articulate that triangle towards the, the wrong thing if you're not careful. Um, could you comment a little bit on insider threat management? Um, wow, these questions are all over the place. Um, great question, insider threat management. Um, I, I think that the insider threat problem is, is interesting because traditionally, you know, the, the term insider threat, um, sometimes folks assume that to mean someone with nefarious intent. And I think what's, uh, what, what's, happened, especially this past year, is it's become increasingly obvious that the insider threat um, isn't, isn't just someone with malicious intent, but it's someone who can inadvertently expose your organization. Uh, you know, Heather earlier on in the introduction was talking about how um, organizations are moving from, you know, one central office to 50 branch offices, sometimes 500, sometimes 50,000 branch offices across the country during this pandemic because everyone's working from home and, and it greatly in, in, increases the exposure to your enterprise, depending on how you're securing that remote workforce. Um, and, and I think that's, you know, that's one area that you have to look very closely at is if you assume that your insider threat program is all about tracking, that, you know, if you're looking for the type of, the type classical type of insider threat use case where you're looking for someone who appears that they're gonna exit the organization and put a bunch of data onto a thumb drive and, and steal it, et cetera. Um, you know, that's still important, but with the remote work environment and the new normal as it were, um, you know, there's, there's very few who expect that we're all gonna to return to the office. There's going to be a hybrid scenario for the foreseeable future, if not forever. Um, the insider threat problem has morphed and you really need to invest in things like, you know, it seems simplistic, but things like email security, things like endpoint detection, endpoint EDR systems, um, et cetera. Uh, and I've, I've one other question here. Um, in a federated search, how do you architect your search engine we are seeing a lot of interest in the ELK stack, but what else do you recommend? Um, great question. So um, we, we also are seeing the ELK stack throughout the industry in heavy use. Um, the Cloud Pack for Security does support the Elasticsearch stack as one of the data sources that you can connect to it um, to federate those analytics and build those applications on top. Um, one thing that uh, I would recommend to anybody who's looking to use the ELK stack in their environment as either a data lake or, or uh, uh, some type of data warehouse is to make sure that you think hard about the schema, the data schema that you're using in that environment. Um, we talked about data modeling earlier and how important it is. And it, it's, it's very important for Elasticsearch as well. Um, we tend to often see clients kind of throwing all their data into Elasticsearch cluster and expecting that they're going to get a lot of value out of that cluster um, when what they end up seeing over time is because the data, they haven't invested anything into the data modeling, it can be very hard to get um, analytics and insights out of that environment en masse later as it grows. And if you look at Elastic's uh, documentation in this area, they have a data model called Elastic Common Schema. Uh, they created it uh, early last year and all of their cybersecurity products in, and, um, and including their endpoint security product, which they acquired from Endgame, um, are, are either already supporting ECS or are moving to ECS. Um, and ECS or Elastic Common Schema is basically going to be the de facto data format for Elasticsearch. And I would highly recommend that if you're looking at leveraging Elasticsearch that you learn about ECS 
you try to figure out how you can get your data into that format, how you can figure out how to get your tool chains to work with that format, because it should greatly reduce, you know, your headaches and work effort down the road. Um, you know, one of the things that I always recommend to people is um, if you can figure out uh, where the community is going, not, not just where the industry is going, but where the community is going, where the people on the ground are going, as they develop things like community detections, community analytics, threat intelligence, et cetera, um, figure out what the community is gravitating towards to and try to stay with that motion because you'll, you'll be able to consume all of these, these open developed analytics in the community and leverage them in your environment without having to spend a lot of time, money and effort adapting those to a different data schema that, that you created because you weren't following what the community was doing. Um, I don't see any other questions coming in. Um, so I guess with that, I'll uh, hand it off and um, thank you very much and enjoy the rest of the conference.